Institute for Theoretical Physics in Santa Barbara. And um, it's gone quite a long way to be here. Okay, yeah, I'll be using that. Okay. Uh, I, I uh, have had a bit of trouble uh, getting here. I've been traveling since Friday afternoon. And so, but anyway, I got here, even though I'm, uh, so I'm happy to be here, and I'm very happy to be, uh, to have a chance to discuss physics with uh, especially the young people in the audience in Africa. So I'm a little bit tired today, but uh, once I recover, um, I would be more than happy to talk to the students about uh, physics. Um, I looked at the, I was um, last in South Africa at, the, uh, at a theoretical physics school in, held in Chichikama. And I looked it up, I looked at the proceedings to find out how long ago that was, and it was held on from January 17 to January 18 in 1994, so that was exactly 10 years ago. Uh, I remember it was a very interesting time because it was just a changeover from uh, one government to the other. Now, uh, I was asked uh, to give a talk about back-of-the-envelope calculations uh, in physics. Many years ago, I gave a course uh, based entirely on back-of-the-envelope calculations. Maybe we can turn on the lights. And this was really a a really fun course to, to give. Um, when I was an undergraduate, um, John Wheeler said to me, uh, never, never calculate uh, unless you already know the answer. And I think this is the biggest mistake that physics students tend to make. A lot of physics students just blindly calculate away. So I completely agree with Wheeler on this. You should never calculate unless you already know the answer. So now, Wheeler called uh, this kind of physics... A horseback physics, um, uh, the kind of physics you can do while you're riding a horse these days, of course. It's more like if you're stuck on a, a bus somewhere and you don't have pencil and paper and you have to work some problems out in your physics. I describe it as um, children's basketball physics because I, um, when my children were young, they won various school basketball teams, which I have to attend the various basketball games. And um, I have to sit through the sit through these very boring games, and actually, I can't believe how many calculations I managed to do, which I am totally unable to do in an office, because the point is that if you're sitting there without pencil and paper, it sharpens your mind, and so it's actually um, not an easy thing to do. Um, and Wheeler's sentiment. Uh, is reflected also in a famous quote that Rudolf Pyle said to Hans Bethe, no less than Hans Bethe, that uh, in, since uh, most of you know Afrikaans, you can read German as well, that first you do the thinking, then you do the integral or the calculation. Okay, now most physicists do it the other way around. They don't do any thinking at all if they uh, actually get, they do the calculation without doing the thinking. So back of the envelope calculations are actually a lot of fun, and it's um, really an art form, often quite amazing, which you can get at the physics without doing a detailed calculation. So um, let me give a first example, very elementary. Um, it's, um, so as you all know, uh, the key in doing back-of-the-envelope calculation, one of the most important things is dimensional analysis. So as they say in elementary school, dimensional analysis is our friend. So that's the first thing to remember. And, but, however, the next most important thing to remember is it often needs to be, complement, to be supplemented by some physics and even more importantly, uh, by common sense. Okay, so which uh, physics students tend not to have. And I recently tried this. As I'll come to, I tried this on uh, some of my graduate students in uh, 
Santa Barbara. Okay, so the simplest problem is, of course, Galileo's problem, the period of the pendulum. We all know how to do it. Now, we can do dimensional analysis, so if we have a pendulum of length L and mass M. Then you write down the relevant physical quantity. It's the length of the pendulum, the gravitational acceleration G, and the mass. Okay? So uh, length, of course, has dimension of length. Uh, G has dimension of length over time square. And now, what about mass? Well, here's where physics comes in. Uh, because you know the driving force is the force of gravity, which is uh, proportional to m, while the resistance to this force, namely the inertial force, you know, the inertial um, uh, term, is also proportional to m, so therefore the mass drops out. We'll see this later in a more sophisticated example. But this is also, you see, follows from dimensional analysis. Okay? So uh, that if you only have these two quantities and you want to calculate the period of the pendulum, how much time it takes for it to go through one oscillation, uh, clearly uh, there's no way for the mass to come in. You can't form something that has the dimension of time. So therefore, this is, follows from dimensional analysis. So this is an example in which it's uh, sort of very nice that the dimensional analysis confirms a physical reasoning. So I think, as we all know, I start with a very, very elementary example. Uh, the period is some number times the square root of L over G. As you can see, if I divide L by G, the, L can, the length cancels out, and I get time squared, so I need a square root. So therefore, it goes like this. So you always check against intuition. Another principle is that, so in this particular case, we see that as we increase the length of the pendulum, if you imagine the pendulum is very, very long, the period should increase. It should take longer. So that's right. Okay, now we go to a uh, somewhat more complicated example, somewhat more sophisticated example, um, is deep ocean waves. Okay. So we imagine that we're on the surface of the ocean and the water waves going by. And what we want to find out is the, what is called the dispersion relation, namely the relationship between the frequency omega and k, which is known as the wave number. Uh, in the previous talk on cosmology, uh, the, the term wave number was mentioned by Professor Farrell. Uh, so the wave number is basically 1 over the wavelength. Okay. So omega has dimension of 1 over t, k has dimension of 1 over l. And now we write down all the relevant physical quantities. Okay? So gravity, uh, again, the acceleration due to gravity, little g, then the density of water. And so I gave two graduate students in the University of California uh, this problem to do. I told them to go to the blackboard and show me how to calculate deep ocean waves. And this is a very good exercise for students because for some strange reasons, Universities do not teach such things, important things like ocean waves anymore. Um, so, first of all, so they started, what they, these two students, they started writing down compressibility and viscosity and everything else they can think of. Now, this is what I meant by common sense or physics sense. As a sense, uh, as a physicist, you have to have a sense of how physics goes. So, I asked the students, okay, compressibility, is that relevant? So the water is going up and down. Are the water be really being squeezed? And I asked these guys, have you ever tried to squeeze a, a, a ball of water? And the compressibility of water is extremely high. Okay? So this is where the total lack of common sense. Is viscosity important? How sticky is water? It's totally irrelevant. So these things are both out. And what about the density of water? Then these guys worry about the density of water. But this is out by physics, and it's the same physics as in the simple pendulum problem because, as I said, the force of, how does water wave work? The force of gravity wants to bring the water down, and then the inertial force of, the, of a certain amount of water, it comes down, and then it, it overshoots, and then it pushes the, other, the trough up. And so the density of water, the uh, gravitational force acting on a body of water is proportional to rho, but so is the inertial force. So therefore, rho must cancel out. So by physics, it cancels out. So therefore, we are really, if we want to have a relationship between omega and k, 
uh, we really only have little g. That's the point of the problem. Okay? So therefore, you see immediately, at this point, since this has dimensional length over time square, the only thing that it could be is that omega square has to be proportional to gk, to go like gk. So that is the dispersion relation. Now, k, on the other hand, is a vector, right? So therefore, omega 4, because the direction of the wave, the propagation of the wave matters, so um, therefore, you shouldn't write it like this, because this k would then just be uh, the magnitude of k. So the correct relation, in fact, it turns out omega 4 uh, g squared k vector squared to form a scalar. And so the equation of motion is very, actually very unusual if you go to position space. You find that it involves a fourth derivative in time. I mentioned, I used this particular example uh, because this is a very amusing example. This is not the kind of dispersion relation you normally see that involves the fourth power of frequency. Okay, and you see that follows purely from dimensional analysis. Okay? <coughs> So I ask you to remember this equation, or equivalently this equation, for the next transparency. This is a very nice story um, uh, that in World War II, an American admiral, um, he orders a lot of aerial reconnaissance uh, photos of enemy ships in the South Pacific. So the idea is that uh, he would send airplanes going all over the South Pacific and take pictures of ships, take photographs of ships moving. And so he's a, here's a ship that's moving at velocity V this way, and the wake of the ship opens up like this, and there's a certain angle here, okay? So the Amaro's idea is that um, you take a lot of these photographs and by measuring this angle, looking at the photographs and seeing what this angle is, you can figure out how fast the ships are moving, the, enemy sh the, the various ships are moving. And the, his common sense or his intuition is that the faster the ship is moving, the smaller this angle would be. <coughs> okay. Okay, so uh, here, so let us find a, by dimensional analysis, find a formula uh, for this angle. Okay. So the, there are only two things that comes in the acceleration due to gravity, which is dimension L over T squared and the velocity of the ship L over T. Because on this scale, you, can, you might say, what about the size of the ship and so on? But on this scale, you know, the, this, you know, the difference between a destroyer and an aircraft carrier is going to be not negligible. They're essentially point particles. So... Um, so again, this is where common sense comes in. Okay? Students that write down that the size of the ship and so on and so forth matters, they're not thinking on the right scale. But once you get to this point, you realize that theta is um, actually a universal number. It's independent of the velocity. So the admiral is, uh, in the story, the admiral, you know, the whole point of this kind of story is, of course, the admiral is completely, totally stupid, and all those photographs uh, totally useless, right? Because the angle, in fact, is the same, independent of the velocity. So it's totally independent of velocity. So this is what you would conclude from dimensional analysis. So um, now, so therefore, it's actually a universal number. Like, it's an interesting exercise for you to calculate. So I challenge the students in uh, here, uh, for those of you who think that you are good theoretical physicists, you should be able to calculate this number, okay? This is calculated in my course on fluid dynamics when I give a course. So you have everything you know already, okay? You don't have to have taken a course on fluid dynamics because you know the dispersion relation from the previous transparency. You, you know how water waves behave. So it's a universal number. Okay, there are many, many examples uh, in physics, as I said, I gave a whole course on back-of-the-envelope calculations. So here's an example, a nice example, from uh, condensed matter physics or solid-state physics. Well, one of the things you might ask uh, from everyday observation, you take a piece of metal or take a, you know, to, to, in this kind of approximation, 
uh, piece of wood is almost the same, but take a piece of metal and you hit the metal this way, the sound propagates in the metal. If, so the speed of sound in metal, we know, is very, it is, although fast by human standards, of course, it's very, very small compared to the speed of light. So let's try to understand why the speed of sound is so small. That should be one of the mysteries that keep you up awake at night, okay, if you are a physicist in spirit. Now, many people are physics students, but they're not physicists. Okay, if you're a physicist, you should try to understand things that go on in the universe. So this is one of the things that I tell my students. They shouldn't go to sleep unless they understand why the speed of sound in metals is so much smaller than the speed of light. Okay? Now, because why is that? It's very uh, mysterious. So this is actually a fairly thing, easy thing to understand. There must be quantum mechanics involved, so therefore h-bar has to come in somewhere. But I, in fact, I'm going to show you that h-bar cannot come in by dimensional analysis. h-bar, remember, uh, as Heisenberg told us, appears in the commutator between momentum and position, and so has dimension of pq, which is m times l over t times the length, which is ml squared over t. There's no way using this you can form a velocity l over t. So you can't get a velocity out. Okay? So it has to do with the speed of light, but not with h bar. And what is the, however, there are two masses in the problem, the mass of the electron, the mass of the nucleon. Right? So in a metal, there's an electron gas, and then there are the nuclei in, in the material. So the physics is that the sound wave is a compressional wave. Okay, so here the pressure is due to the Fermi gas of electrons. The electrons form a Fermi gas, and so they provide the pressure. Why the inertial resistance to this compression is due to the inertial mass of the nucleus. So you expect <coughs> that the speed of sound is governed by the ratio of these two masses, and the ratio of these two masses is 10 to the minus 3. So you expect the speed of sound to be Me over Mn raised to some power P. Now, interestingly, uh, this ratio is already quite small, 10 to the minus 3. So you actually don't need a very high power in order to understand what's going on. Okay? So you, we have understood something in nature. Okay? The smallness of the speed of sound is due to the smallness of the electron compared to the nuclear mass. Now, to actually calculate P, goes beyond back of the envelope calculation. So this was calculated in a course I gave on many body physics many years ago. Okay. So this is an example in which dimensional analysis is not enough. I give this particular example because it, there are two masses involved. Okay, so I can go on and uh, give many, many uh, uh, examples. So that, I mean, there's an enormous richness. As I said, I gave a whole course on this. But here, what I thought I would do, since one of the themes in this uh, school is cosmology, I would then try to focus on giving some examples uh, from cosmology. But before I do that, uh, let us uh, move on, and uh, let, let us first talk a little bit about the units of fundamental physics. Okay, when we do fundamental physics, um, what kind of units should we use? But one of the things we know is that we don't want to use an English king's foot. I have already forgotten. I've even forgotten which particular English king it was whose foot was used. Okay. So we want to use fundamental units that's relevant for physics. Now, Mr. Planck wrote two great papers in his career. Most physicists write zero great papers in their career, and it's enough if you write one great paper. So Planck wrote one great paper, but then he wrote a second great paper which is maybe a little bit less known, but perhaps uh, also of great significance, is that he pointed out that once you have h bar, um, you have a fundamental unit of mass, and you don't need English kings anymore to do physics. So with Einstein's uh, special theory of relativity, uh, the speed of light links uh, length and time. Okay? But once you have h bar, uh, you see that mass, length, and time are linked. So h bar over c is mass times length. So you don't need a fun, an, another unit to measure mass. Mass can be measured in units of one over length. Okay? So all we need is a fundamental unit of mass. And here we don't want to use stones. Right? 
So I, before I left, I actually asked around at the Institute of Theoretical Physics, and I actually got various different answers on what a stone is. Some people thought it's 14 pounds, some people think it's 21 pounds, and so on. So we certainly don't want to use stones. So we need to have a fundamental unit of mass. And this fundamental unit of mass turns out to be what is called Planck's, Planck's mass, because Planck introduced it in his great paper. OK, where does that come from? If you go back to sort of high school physics and look at Newton's um, um, potential, uh, gravitational potential between two masses, it's given by GMM over R. And so to do doing dimensional analysis, uh, let us try to determine the dimension of G. So capital G, the dimension of capital G times M squared over L from here, that is supposed to be equal to an energy. But energy is like kinetic energy, mass times velocity squared. So it's M L squared over T squared. But because of special relativity, length and time are the same. So it's really like a mass. So therefore, in this fundamental units that we're doing, that we're using, in which uh, the speed of light and h bar is both set equal to 1, uh, length and time can be expressed in units of mass. Then we see that uh, Newton's constant has dimension of 1 over mass squared. Okay? So this defines, we can define g to be 1 over m Planck squared. So this is the definition of m Planck, if you like. New so we re replace Newton's constant by 1 over m Planck squared. So a very useful number to remember is that the, m, the Planck mass is 10 to the 19, the mass of the nucleon. OK, so is this clear? Uh, if there are any questions, please uh, feel free to ask questions. So these is, are the units that we want to use to study fundamental physics. OK, so let me. Uh, give an example of this. I just gave it last week to some graduate students in Santa Barbara. Let us consider a simple problem. Let's consider a box of a gas of photons. So the gas of um, electromagnetic energy at a temperature, capital T. Now, in many books, there's some, a very stupid symbol called Boltzmann's constant, which is completely historical and of no use to us anymore. Okay. Uh, because Boltzmann's constant is just to convert degrees to energy. And it's just totally historical because at one time people did not realize that temperature was energy. It took one of the great achievements of 18th century and 19th century physics was to recognize that temperature is energy. So the concept of degrees was completely arbitrary because Fahrenheit, Mr. Fahrenheit, just uh, defined his own body's temperature to be 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So there's no fundamental significance to that. So we'll drop k as well. So k is set equal to 1, Boltzmann's constant. So in case somebody here is confused about that. OK, then we use the basic. I'll show you that using the basic uh, laws of thermodynamics, which is that the free energy, the variation of free energy is minus s dt minus p dv, where s is the entropy, we can use dimensional analysis to obtain a very important result. OK, so we do dimension analysis. We write down what the free energy is. What is the free energy? Well, we have a volume of gas at a temperature T. So these are the only two variables around. Now, since temperature is energy, and I just told you on the previous transparency that energy is like 1 over length. So if we have a volume here, we have to multiply by three powers of temperature to make it dimensionless. So once we made it dimensionless, we have to multiply by something that has dimension of energy in order to get an energy, right? Since free energy is energy. And this can only be multiplied by some pure number in front. OK, something like pi squared over 15, <coughs> or something like this, or pi squared over 5. Now we can immediately calculate the pressure from thermodynamics. Pressure is minus the FdV, holding T fixed. This is minus AT fourth. The entropy is minus 4AVT cubed. You can calculate them the energy because the energy is given by this formula, free energy. And you immediately get the energy is minus 3AVT4. And let us define the energy density to be the energy divided by the volume. Okay, so that's the energy per unit volume. And you immediately get the equation of state of a photon gas because if I compare this with this, 
you see that they're the same. They both depend on t to the fourth, except there's a three. So we immediately obtain the equation of state of a photon gas. P, the pressure is one third the energy density. And this is an example of dimensional analysis in physics in which um, <coughs> the overall numerical constant factor is actually determined. So we apply this to the expanding universe since one of the focus on this school is on cosmology. So we want to do a back of the envelope calculation without going into the details of the physics. Capital R of T is the so-called scale factor of the universe. And it's, we're not going to worry about how it's defined precisely. It's precisely defined as, part of the, as something that appears in a metric of the general relativity. But let's not worry about that. We just think of it roughly as something that measures the size of the universe. So let's do some back of the envelope heuristics. So this is one of these hand-waving type of arguments. We take the universe as a ball of radius R of t, which is changing with time as the universe expands, um, with a certain amount of energy density rho. Okay? So the kinetic energy of the universe is its mass times r dot square. So this is just mv square, half mv square. So the mass, which is rho r q times r dot square. The potential energy is, according to Newton, is just g uh, times the mass square divided by r. So let's roughly equate back of the envelope heuristics which tell us the kinetic energy and potential energy are comparable. In which case, you see we equate these two terms. We see we, the rho cancels. Uh, there, there's two powers of rho here. So on the right-hand side, there's one power of rho. And then the powers of r works out to be this way. So r dot square over r square is equal to g rho. And this is the fundamental equation of cosmology. Uh, there's a minor technical detail here. We have ignored the curvature term. But it turns out that the curvature term is experimentally, in fact, zero. Okay, so we'll take this as our fundamental equation cosmology. Okay, now the early universe, we can consider an epoch in the early, early universe in which the particles are highly relativistic. So if they're highly relativistic when the universe is very hot and they're moving around very, very fast, uh, they're essentially massless. The mass of the particles can be neglected. And so um, they act like a gas of photons. The, so now um, we can do some calculation. Uh, one thing we can do is to invoke entropy conservation. So we have to write down what entropy is. So entropy, again, follows from dimensional analysis. It has to be proportional to the volume of the universe. So it has to go like R cubed. But I just told you temperature has dimension of one over length. So uh, therefore, it can only be R cubed times T cubed. It's also proportional to the number of species of particles, that, all these different particles. But we won't bother to keep track of this number of species. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Is it? Okay, um, so, so we're not going to bo bother with this kind of details. So we we'll just say roughly, so entropy is conserved as a constant. So therefore, the temperature as the universe uh, expands should scale like 1 over R. Now, the energy density, I just told you on the previous transparencies. So all these, transparen all these back of the envelope calculations hang together. I, the other thing I told you is that the energy density rho here is E over V, so it goes like temperature to the fourth power, temperature to the fourth power here. And so the energy density goes like temperature to the, proportion, to the fourth power, and so it's proportional to 1 over R to the fourth power. 
Okay? So now we plug in the fundamental equations of the expansion of the universe that we calculated on the previous transparencies to, obtained by our hand-waving calculations. And since rho goes like 1 over r to the fourth power, we see that we get an equation r r dot, if you multiply out, is proportional to a constant. But this equation we can immediately integrate. r r dot is just, if we integrate this, it's just r square, and the right-hand side, the integral of the right-hand side is time. So therefore, we immediately obtain that the universe the early universe has expanded like square root of t, which is very, very fast as t goes to zero. And this is one of the problems in cosmology, as you know, that led to the introduction of inflationary universe. This one. So the universe expands extremely fast early on, according to this calculation. So you see, just by this kind of um, back-of-the-envelope hand-waving calculation without doing a lot of details, we can understand a lot about the universe. Okay, let me show you another example of some, some very simple um, calculations, which is we're going to talk about entropy again. Okay? Uh, the second law of thermodynamics, I assume that you all know, says the entropy increases in any physical process. Now, Bekenstein was a graduate student at Princeton at the time, and he said this really puzzles him about black holes because at one time, it was believed by the best and the brightest minds in physics that black holes have no entropy. And the reason people believe that is because black holes have no internal degrees of freedom. It's just a black hole. Now, Bekenstein, as a student, was, um, was willing to challenge, was brave enough to challenge this uh, expert's view. And he said, how could this be? Suppose I throw a box of gas into a black hole then I start with a black hole of mass m. It ends up with a black hole of mass m prime. The black hole becomes a little bit heavier. So the entro the, the, according to the second law of thermodynamics, the black hole entropy plus the entropy of the box of gas has to be less than the entropy of the black, or the black hole you end up with. But if it was believed by the experts that black holes have no entropy, uh, then is zero is equal to zero here, then says the entropy of a box of gas is less than zero, is negative. And that cannot be. So Bekenstein showed that black holes must have entropy. But once you have entropy, then by the laws of thermodynamics, it must have a temperature because uh, temperature is just related to the entropy. And if it has temperature, it has to radiate, it has to radiate ra um, things away. So this completely changed our understanding of black holes. And this, of course, was the famous work of Hawking, of Hawking radiation. So black holes is not just things fall in and nothing ever comes out again. In fact, things fall into black holes, it form black hole, and black hole radiates. Now, in fact, the remarkable thing is that we can even give a horseback calculation of the Hawking temperature. So... Um, a very rough calculation. We have a black hole of mass m. OK, so we try to write down all the relevant physical dimensions. And I've taught you enough already in these few transparencies so that you can do this calculation. OK, so let's write down all the relevant things. OK, so you say there's the mass of the black hole. Then you may ask, what about the radius of the black hole? But black hole is a warp in space a gra due to gravity. Uh, space is warped. And the length scale, the radius of the black hole, just the length scale over which the space is warped. And that is determined by the laws of general relativity. And so the radius should not be an independent uh, quantity. The radius should be determined by um, the mass. And in fact, we can determine the radius again by dimensional analysis. Just by dimensional analysis, the radius has to be, uh, because g, remember I told you, has dimension of 1 over mass squared. It's, one of a, it's the definition of Planck mass. Therefore, it ha it, the only thing it can be that has the dimension of a length is g times m, which has dimension of 1 over mass. Okay, So the radius of a black hole is, in fact, gm. And if you have taken a course on general relativity, you know that that's the right answer. And there's also here we can invoke our physics sense, if you like, uh, some physicists have sense and some people don't. 
and uh, they can both equally calculate. But uh, so the physics sense is that uh, as g goes to zero, if you think of turning gravity off, then the black hole should disappear, so the radius should go to zero. So this formula makes sense. Now we're ready to calculate Hawking temperature already by dimensional analysis, and the entropy is has to be dimensionless, right? So therefore, it should vanish as we turn off gravity. So, but we have to make a guess. It just doesn't follow from dimensional analysis alone, but again, this is sort of physics sense, if you like. Um, we guess that it's the first power in G, that, because that's the easiest thing to guess. Why first power? Because it should vanish if I turn off gravity by the same reasoning, right? So therefore, it has to be GM squared. Just like the radius is GM, the entropy is dimensionless, so it has to be the gravitational constant times two powers of mass squared in order to make it dimensionless. So here, this is uh, very, very, it's a guess I uh, emphasize. Because since GM squared is dimensionless, you can always multiply this by a function of GM squared. Okay? But it's kind of a physics sense to feel that there's not some complicated function there. Um, so now we can calculate temperature because according to thermodynamics, dE is TdS. But E is just the mass here. What is the energy of the black hole? Just its mass. So therefore, immediately, 1 over T is dS dm. But dS is equal to gm squared, so dS dm is gm. So immediately we see temperature is to be 1 over gm. And that's, in fact, the correct Hawking temperature. Okay? So... In fact, we learn something by this very simple kind of calculation. We learn something very important about black holes, that black hole evaporation is explosive. As the mass goes down, the temperature actually goes up. This is a very unusual kind of behavior. As it evaporates, it becomes smaller. It actually becomes hotter. So the final process is very explosive. Okay, so we guessed that S is equal to gm squared, but it seems like a very plausible guess. Now, to actually calculate this thing, and in fact, to calculate the number in front, S is equal to, it requires a little bit of field theory, but not very much. So, for example, it's done on page 264 of my book on quantum field theory. Okay, there I show the students doing a very simple calculation that will also fit on the, almost fit on the back of an envelope. You can actually calculate the exact number. But that's not what we're talking about here. Now, in fact, this whole subject of entropy of black holes and so on, some of you may be aware, or if you're not aware, I'm telling you this, is very much of a hot topic for research. In fact, in um, Santa Barbara, the last seminar, the last theoretical physics seminar of 2003 was on this topic, and the first seminar on the year 2004 was also on this topic. Let's ask ourselves a uh, simple question, which is, can the entropy of an isolated, stable system in asymptotic flat space be arbitrarily large? Okay, so is it possible that you can make a system, entropy roughly is how disorganized, how chaotic a system is. Can you make it arbitrarily chaotic? Well, some people think there may be an upper bound in the universe, okay? And... Um, the physics, one physics argument is that if you pump entropy in a system, it requires energy, and energy gravitates. So therefore, it's all bound up with notions of gravity and quantum gravity. In 1981, Bekenstein, he said, no, the entropy cannot be arbitrarily large, and he, in fact, he proposed an upper bound. So he conjectured this upper bound, and he says it's 2 pi, the entropy, which is dimensionless, remember, it's bounded above, by the energy of the system and the size of the system. This is the size and, en and energy. So you see this is dimensionless. E times R is dimensionless. But I wanted to restore H bar and C, which we have set equal to 1. And to restore, it's very easy because we remember H bar was momentum times length, so it's ML squared over T. And H bar C has this uh, dimension. So therefore, we see we have to divide by H bar C. And the reason that I restore H bar is to show that 
classically, so this is strictly has to do with quantum mechanics. Classically, there is no bound. Okay, you can classically you can make something as chaotic as possible, but quantum mechanically there may be a bound. Now this was proposed in 1981, so it's now 20 some years. For the last 23 uh, years, uh, people have argued over this bound, whether it's true or false. It's a big debate. Okay, whether the bound. Uh, whether this bound is actually true bound. So this is a interesting question for you guys to think about. Uh, I was, uh, I, when I arrived at the school, I realized this is a very strange school. I thought all the professors would be here already, but apparently not. So I guess I'm not late in arriving. Uh, people, I thought that, um, so Don Maroff, who will be here shortly, he's lecturing at the school, and in fact, my colleague in Santa Barbara, um, that is his field of research. So uh, the students here, you're urged to ask Maroff. And you should think about this, yes or no, on this debate, which side of this debate you stand on. So I'll just tell you, Maroff believes is against Bekenstein. He doesn't feel that Bekenstein's bound is correct. Okay, so from this, now let us go to, from entropy, of black holes in cosmology, uh, let me go to a little bit of particle physics and uh, early cosmology again. Okay. Um, let me look at the universe at a temperature of about a few times 10 MeV, so 10, 20 MeV. And the reason for that is because at this epoch, 10, uh, 10 20 MeV, the universe contains... Uh, pro what are the particles that the universe contains? What are the degrees of freedom? At this kind of relatively low um, temperature by the standard of particle physics, uh, we don't have to know anything about string theory, brains, uh, any of this uh, very speculative stuff. We know the universe contains protons, neutrons, electrons, the positron, photons, neutrinos, and antineutrinos. And the particle physics of these guys completely understood so I will start with this relatively cool epoch, and I leave the harder uh, times to the other lecturers at this school, and in which the physics is much more speculative. And what I would like to talk to you about here is to do a back-of-the-envelope calculation on the fate of the neutrinos. So what are the neutrinos doing at this point? Well, they're scattering on each other, for example. Neutrino plus neutrino bar would produce a E plus E minus pair. Neutrinos could scatter on electrons, could start on, scatter on a neutron and produce a proton. These processes are all governed by the weak interaction. The weak interaction is determined by Fermi's coupling constant. Now, um, some of you may have heard of Fermi's coupling constant, and some of you have not. Now, when I prepare these lectures for the school, the organizers were unable to tell me what the level of the students are. And apparently, the level of the students, I was told, um, are very, uh, are, uh, differ enormously. So I, I don't, so when I was writing these lectures, that was one of the difficulties. So uh, some students may know what a Fer Fermi's coupling constant is, and so they know that it has dimension of one of a mass square. But some of you may not know. Okay, so uh, let me just say very easily, as, in as simple a way as I can, um, what, uh, how this comes about. The weak interaction, as we, these days we believe how weak interaction works, is that due to the exchange of a very massive particle called W boson. So a W boson gets exchanged. And so the strength of this process is proportional to the mass of the uh, W boson square. And otherwise, it's like an electromagnetic process. I'm sure that by now some of you have uh, heard that electromagnetism and weak interaction have been unified. And so alpha is just the fine structure constant of uh, electromagnetism. Okay, if you don't know this, then you just have to take this equation for faith, on faith, okay? I just have to tell you that the Fermi coupling constant is like the fine structure constant divided by the mass of the W squared. Okay, so this is one thing I cannot derive for you. Okay, are there any questions? Please feel free to ask questions on any of the things I've said so far. Okay. 
Okay, so if we put in numbers, um, it turns out MW squared, the mass of the W we now know experimentally, is 300 uh, or so uh, uh, GeV. And anyway, alpha, and you put in all the numbers and so on, it's about 10 to the minus 5, 1 over M, the mass of the nucleon square. So uh, I'll use, this is the number I'll use later. Okay, so at this point, we can do some back of the envelope calculation and dimensional analysis. And it's really quite amusing how far, how far we can get and how much physics we can get out uh, by doing very simple uh, kind of uh, analysis. Okay, so imagine that you are a neutrino and you're going through the universe at this point. So you're scattering off different things. Okay, so uh, we want to find out what the cross-section for scattering is. So we want to calculate, in fact, velocity times uh, the cross-section. This is and thermally average. Well, we just do it by dimensional analysis. Okay, this cross-section is, of course has dimension of length squared. That's what you mean by cross-section. It's the area of the cross-section. And so in our fundamental units, it's one over mass squared. Now, quantum mechanics involves the square of the amplitude, right? So the amplitude, I told you, is given by Fermi's coupling constant. So in quantum mechanics, to calculate cross-section, you square the probability of the amplitude, and so you get GF squared. And so the cross, so therefore, GF squared, on the other hand, I just told you, has dimension of 1 over mass squared, so it's 1 over mass to the fourth power. So in order for it to be 1 over mass squared, you have to multiply by 2 powers of temperature squared. Now, and so at this point, temperature is the only energy scale around. You might think, well, there are, how about the masses of the other particles? Well, they're not, none of them is relevant, if you think about it, because the temperature is high enough. So what does the neutrino see? We want to know what the reaction rate of the neutrino is. So if you're a neutrino, you have a cross-section of sigma as you go through the universe. Okay, in time delta t, you travel, velo you travel the distance of v delta t. And you see all these other particles. So all these other particles in this cylinder uh, you would react with. So the reaction rate is very simple. It's just the number density, the number of particles times this V sigma, okay? This is the reaction rate because if I multiply by delta T, it's just the volume times the number of particles in there. So how many times it interact, it's just given by this. But the num so I'm going to do just back of the envelope hand-waving calculations for everybody. Um, the number density is just T cubed because it's a density. It's one over length cubed. So what else can it be, Okay because temperature is 1 over length, so it has to be temperature cubed. V sigma, GF squared, T squared. So we learned that this reaction rate is GF squared, T fifth. Okay? Okay, so um, I wanted you to remember this. So we derive a very important result just by this kind of very, very simple uh, two-line hand-waving argument that it goes like temperature to the fifth power. So the reaction rate is that it goes like temperature to the fifth power, so it drops very, very fast as the universe cools. Now, meanwhile, the universe is expanding. So it's a, now, again, I have already, in five minutes, told you what you would learn in a course on cosmology, which is that the fundamental equations is r dot square of r squared is like g rho. So we immediately see that this has a, a R dot is like 1 over time, R over time. So the R cancels out, and this is like 1 over T squared, where T is some characteristic time scale of the problem. And the energy density, I also told you, goes like temperature to the fourth power, right? So again, neglecting the number of species. So this is the characteristic expansion rate. So we see what the characteristic expansion rate is. It goes like T squared over M Planck, because G is 1 over M Planck squared, Okay. So therefore, this leads to a very important piece of physics because the reaction rate is dropping like temperature to the fifth power. But the expansion rate of the universe is T squared over M Planck. So if when the universe has, say, doubled in size, expanding, the universe is, the universe is doubling very fast, and you, as a poor neutrino, haven't even found someone to scatter off, then what happens? You know, this is 
the, the, the universe is expanding and you're trying to find something to scatter off. And in that time, you are, haven't found anybody to scatter off. You have effectively decoupled, that's the technical term, or frozen out from the rest of the universe. You have, you're no longer relevant to the rest of the universe. You, you're totally decoupled. So this determines the, de, the so-called decoupling temperature of the universe. Okay? So therefore, the decoupling, when you, the temperature at which the neutrino decouples is clearly just when this reaction rate becomes smaller than the expansion rate, than the expansion rate. So just set these two things equal, okay? So with the numbers I told you before, we have this t to the fifth is equal to temperature square. So you find immediately that the neutrino decoupling temperature is given by this. And since I told you what the Planck mass is, is 10 to the 19, that of the nucleon mass. This is 10 to the minus 9 to the 1. So it turns out to be 1 MeV. So this is the power of the back of the envelope calculation. If you do a complicated, precise calculation, you know, to be precise, it probably take you six months, you know, with computer codes that would, uh, you know, pages and pages of computer codes. But of course, if you want to get the exact answer for detailed work on cosmology, you need to know what the detailed answer is. Somebody has done that for the electron neutrino. People have done this precise calculation and find 3.5 MeV. So you see the back of the envelope calculation is actually uh, very, very good. Now, I want to uh, conclude by giving another example, but first I have to tell you a fact. Uh, the number of protons and neutrons, technically they're called baryons, protons and neutrons together. Um, they conserve. It's very, very small compared to the number of photons. Uh, one way of saying this, so, so the number of baryons to the number of photons, you can uh, inter define a ratio called eta. Now, as the universe expands, the number of photons go down like one over the volume cube, one over the volume, so one over our cube. This is from our photon gas calculation. Remember I told you that the entropy and the number density goes down like one over our cube? And the number of baryons goes like one of our cube because baryon number is conserved. The number of protons and neutrons in the universe is fixed. I mean, at this, at this late time, they're not created, they're not destroyed, they can't disappear. So the density of baryons as the universe expands has to go like one of our cube. Therefore, if you take the ratio, uh, it's actually cosmologically uh, constant. So this number actually has cosmological meaning, and it turns out this number is 10 to minus 10. So uh, what I want you to understand is that number of baryons is very, very small compared to the number of photons. So another way of saying this is that some people say the universe is really uh, dominated. Now, of course, we all know there are other things. There's the dark energy. There's also dark matter. But the universe as a whole is really a sea of photons. And the matter of which we are made of, it's just a... It's like a tiny con contamination. It's just a little bit of dirt, okay, at the level of 10 to the minus 10. It's a ten, 1 in 10 to the 10 contamination if you compare the number of protons and neutrons to the number of photons. Okay. So this allows me to tell you the, another back-of-the-envelope calculation. And actually, I want to introduce this example because this is where unless you do things carefully, you would get the wrong answer. Okay, we talked about the neutrino going through the early universe and decoupling from the universe. What about the photon? The photon also decouples from the universe at some point. Well, if you think about a photon, what, ha what, has, what, what happens to it? The photon has been interacting with all the charged particles in the universe, right, as the universe expands. So it's been scattering off the electrons and the protons until suddenly... The universe cools and cools, and suddenly some highly newfangled objects, some of these, um, some new objects suddenly appeared in the universe, things that did not observe exist before. Very fashionable, the latest new thing. Okay? These things called atoms suddenly appeared because the electrons bound to the protons. And so the interaction rate 
for the photon drops drastically. Okay, so before, the, because the universe was too hot, the electrons and the protons cannot bound into atoms. But as the universe cools below a certain point, the electrons and protons are moving so slowly they 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 can overcome their kinetic energy and bind together. Now the photon, um, be, the interaction with charged particles is huge, but when the interaction of photons with atoms is very, very small, it's tiny. I mean, although it's important in our everyday life, otherwise we would not be able to see anything, uh, photons, but the interaction of photons with ordinary atoms is completely negligible because the interaction of the electron and the interaction of the proton almost cancels out because the positive charge and the negative charge. So therefore, uh, the um, photon would suddenly decouple. So at this point, the photon is said to be decoupled from the universe. Okay, so let's, let's ask ourselves to do some Hall-Speck physics to understand what the decoupling temperature of the photon would be. So you would have said, okay, well, this is when the photon decouples. So it has to be the, the binding energy of the hydrogen atom, which we all learn in school, is 13.6 electron volts, or namely, let's say, 10 electron volts. So at 10 electron volts, when the universe, the temperature drops to 10 electron volts, photons should decouple. So I introduced this example as a word of caution in doing horseback physics when the horse is galloping too fast, because this is actually the wrong answer. And the reason it is the wrong answer, and if you t have given this answer, you will have failed the course completely, um, is because of this fact. because there's so many baryons per photon. So for every proton in the universe, there's 10 to the 10 photons. Okay, so how does that work? So it's biased because there are 10 to the 10 photons for every proton. So the photon energy also follows the distribution, and as you know, sort of like a Maxwell distribution, in fact, given by Boltzmann. It's more sophisticated because it's a quantum particle, so it follows this thing called a Bose-Einstein distribution. But physically, it goes like that. It's, it's a function of the energy of the photon. The peak occurs at the temperature of the photon gas. But there's an exponential tail, which is, uh, according to Boltzmann, is given by this at any given temperature. There are very, very few guys in this tail. Right? But these few guys, although there are very, very few guys with a lot of energy, but because there's so many photons for every proton, this overcompensate, this bias back the effect. Right? So these, these extremely energetic guys could continue to tear the atoms apart. So the temperature has to drop much below 10 EV before the photon would decouple. So this is more a more sophisticated uh, back of the envelope calculation, the decoupling temperature of the, of the photon. So how is it determined by? It's determined by 1 over eta, which is 10 to the 10, this number 10 to the 10 photons per proton, times the exponential tail given by Boltzmann. It's only when this 10 to the 10 times this tiny exponential tail drops below 1 that the photon decouples. Right? So, so do I make the physics clear? The Boltzmann tail tells you that there are very, very few photons that are... Um, that are that energetic. So it's like the distribution of wealth, right? Very, very few poor rich people on the tail, but the rich people have a lot of power. Then you, it makes a big difference. And so because there's so many of them, them per proton, you have to multiply by this factor 10 to 10, which is huge. So the condition is actually this. So if you take, now let us solve for this equation by taking the logarithm. If you take the logarithm, log of eta minus one is minus delta of t is like zero. So therefore, solving for this equation, you see the temperature at which the photon decouples is not delta, but delta divided by log of eta inverse. Okay. So the decoupling temperature for the photon, this log of 10 to the 10 works out to be 20. So it's actually suppressed by a factor of 20. And if you plug in the numbers, uh, you get 5,000 degrees K, which is reasonably close to the uh, precise value. So after this point in the history of the universe and the photons basically decouple, there are sort of trivial minor effects like stars producing light and our light bulbs producing light and so on. But in the universe as a whole, the photons have just been drifting freely and happily ever since. 
until some of them were caught in New Jersey, uh, which led to the Nobel Prize. So, okay, I conclude here. And um, just to summarize, I tell you that I think I've given you in an hour or so um, some ideas that um, uh, it's very important to be able to do back of the envelope calculations. And it's really an art form. And you can understand a lot of physics without doing long, detailed calculations. Thank you. So that's it for today. We don't have a